Good morning, everybody. Welcome to my talk. Um, my talk will be about being radically candid um, and transactional analysis that leads to effective leadership. Um, my name is Michel van Veldi. Um, I am the founder of Wanshu, a creative and digital agency based in the Netherlands. We work for international clients. Uh, I'm also a board member of the Drupal Association. Um, today I'm standing here on behalf of my agency, not the board, I have to say this. Um, I'm also a board member of the Economic Board in Utrecht. Um, I'm standing in front of you um, with a story about what happened to my company and particularly to me as a leader of the company. Um, I started and founded the agency in 2006 um, and we were, I can honestly say, successful from day one. I landed my first client on the day I regist registered my, my agency um, and I jumped on the train and the train became a rocket and I was living the brilliant life of a successful entrepreneur until 2017. And this is where I started to learn everything about true leadership. Um, and I'm going to share you, the, well, everything I've learned in the last two years. Um, in 2017, um, we lost a major client. We knew this was coming, um, and we had to find another and replace that client, you know, to, to, to keep the operation going. Um, that took a couple of months longer than we expected. And at the same time, uh, one of my colleagues got into a burnout. Another colleague went on skiing holidays, and she got into a skiing accident. And these are just like three hurdles I had to come across early in 2017. Um, I won't go into detail, but I was facing, uh, somewhere around May or June, I was facing 17 hurdles. Um, and I remember one day, early in the morning, I was standing under the shower, and it felt like Mike Tyson had done a workout on me. You know, just, I felt really, you know, stressed out because of all the hurdles I had to come across. So, being an entrepreneur, I decided to uh, take matters in my own hand and steer the company into the new bright ocean and go for growth again. I made a lot of mistakes in terms of my leadership skills and in terms of co my communication skills. And this is what I'm going to talk about to today. Um, there is a happy ending to the story. Um, 2018 was a record-breaking year again. Uh, you know, so we're back into the clear. We're doing absolutely fine. Uh, but it took 2017, took a lot of strain and toll on me. Um, and this is what this talk is about. This, is, this talk is about leadership and effective communication. And believe me, I will share some valuable insights that will help you not only from a business perspective, but also from a personal perspective. All right, let's talk about leadership. Um, this is, when we talk about leadership, um, what leadership looks like. You know, you're right in the top, you know, and the second bit, this is what leadership feels like. Um, the difference between leadership versus management is quite simple. Management is working through routine processes. <coughs> leadership is like walking into the void. You have to find new territory, you have to uh, come across hurdles that have never been done before. Um, and management then, then takes over and turns this into management processes and goes to the daily routine. So leadership is leading the agency into well, new waters, new territories, and that's walking into the void because you have no idea what you come across. Um, leadership is, and, and this is uh, what McKinsey uh, found out, um, is like oxygen. You know, um, leaders are investing more and more into leadership skills because they know um, it's true value to their company uh, and their organization. So leadership throughout the company, it's not only the management team or the board of directors. No, leadership you know, is necessary throughout all parts of the uh, organization. So let's take a look, look at the Drupal community. You want to come up with a new module and you've got to convince uh, other developers to do so. That's leadership as well. All right, so I'm going to walk you through some, a question um, and, and some pictures. And the question is, these people, I'm, I'm going to show you some photos for like a couple of seconds per photo. And I'm going to ask you the questions to you, are these leaders yes or no? 
Was he the leader, yes or no? All right. I knew this was coming. <laughs> had to be in the air, of course. I had to do it. Remember this guy? Yeah. So think about it. You know, um, were these leaders? And the second question is, are you a leader? I think you are. Every one of us is a leader. You know, could be within the Drupal community, could be at your work, could be at home, you know, you know leading your children into a new life. You know? So leadership is, is not just from management or a board perspective. Leadership is, you know, found in, in, in every position in life. Um, so, so here I was. Um, well, you know, Mike Tyson just done his workout on me and was not feeling very happy. Um, so I started to do some self-analysis. Um, and I came quite a long way. But I also learned there's some pitfalls to doing self-analysis. The pitfalls of self-analysis is, is that, that it's very difficult to be objective. Um, you need to be accurately uh, on, basic, on, on both your strength and your weaknesses, but you tend to, you know, um, heavily rely um, on your strength, you know, and downsize your weaknesses. You know, that's that's just a, a basic nature of thing. Um, <clears throat> so, I think I got to about seventy percent, and I knew I was missing something. So, so it's okay, you know, if I don't have it in me with a lot of self-reflection, let's start reading some books. So I came across. Um, well, first it was a podcast, and then. I found this book, which is called Radically Candid. Um, Radically Candid is a book, um, it's written by a, 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 a woman, she's been working uh, uh, with Google, and she, she had a colleague who was not performing really well. Um, and, you know, uh, she knew he, she, uh, 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 that person had, well, quite a bit of problems at home and everything, you know, and she was like really nice to him, you know, she was not open or candid and telling him that he was not performing really well. So as the year went by, she was taking over some of his work, and at the end of the year, uh, the review came up, you know, are we gonna lengthen your, your contract, yes or no? She said, sorry, we're not gonna lengthen your contract. You know, says, well, why not? You know, well, you know, I don't think you perform really well, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then he says, but you never told me. You know, because you were too nice and too sweet, and you are not openly and radically candid to me. So I said, wow, well this is it. You know, I have to be radically candid to my colleagues and steer them into the blue ocean. This is what I'm gonna do. That didn't work out. It really didn't work out. It just turned against me. You know, so, so yeah, being candid is good, but how you communicate, that's where the essence is. So I was like, okay, this is not particularly working. Um, tried some other books, and I was like, okay. And then I remembered this picture. Um, this is Tiger Woods. He's the number one golf player. He was the number one golf player in the world um, until he made some mistakes. I'm not going into depth on that one. Um, but I remember this picture, and I was okay, you are the number one in the world, but you still have a coach behind you. And I thought, okay. So behind every leader, there is a coach, you know? And I said, okay, so let's, you know, go over that bit of ego and says, okay, you know, I'm not good enough, you know, gotta learn. So 
I, you know, found a coach, um, brilliant guy. He's um, uh, into business economics, but also psychology at the same time, um, uh, leadership and organization, organizational change. So um, I still remember going there for uh, the first time, went over to his office, um, and uh, well, we started talking. He says, why do you want to do this? Uh, because it, it looks like you're really busy. He says, well, you know, I want to change. I said, well, that's the first thing I wanted to ask you. Do you want to change? He says, yeah, I want to change. Um, so we entered into some role plays. Um, and I immediately found that I was stuck in terms of my communication. And then he entered me into the world of transactional analysis. TA, it's called. Um, you can Google it, it's really cool. Um, but we're going to deep dive into it in a minute. So transactional analysis, um, every form of communication can be seen as a transaction. You know, it's a transaction in between people. Uh, I want something from you, you want something from me, uh, and we have a conversation about it. I want you to do your job properly. Uh, this, is, this is a transaction as well. <clears throat> so what I learned during that first session that I was stuck in what they call the drama triangle. And this little triangle, believe me, will change your life, if you haven't heard from it yet. Okay, so problems you experience evoke emotions in you. You know, I was heavily emotional because my company was not doing well. You know, and I've been riding the success wave and suddenly there was no more water in, on the wave and it's like, okay, so it's heavily emotional. Um, this will basically got me into, well, there's a bit of fear, some anxiety, some tension, some anger, some frustration. Um, and that emotion evokes a certain behavior. Um, and which kind of behavior that, that varies from person to person. Uh, some will fight, others will flight. That's basic, you know, human nature. You will either fight or flight. Um, some other will paralyze, you know, um, and all, in all cases, it's reactive behavior. Um, you have to respond to your emotion, um, and basically you respond to your emotion, sorry, um, and not the problem. So whenever a problem arises, or, and you feel the anxiety just flowing, flowing through your body, you got to push this aside, you know, and, and basically block all negative emotion and focus on the problem. That's difficult. I'm, I'm not going to say this talk is going to be, lead you into the future, like, yeah, this is going to be difficult to, to do. But if you start, you know, uh, learning this, this is great. So, um, so you don't want to feel uh, annoyed by the, by the emotion. Uh, you want to get rid of the emotion. Um, and when you act on the basis of emotion, you're in the drama triangle. And here we are. Okay. So this is the drama triangle. So here I am, you know, at my office. Colleagues has made a mistake. I'm radically candid. And I say, okay, um, you haven't done your job right. So here I was persecuting somebody not doing his job properly, you know. Um, and this is basically in the right-hand corner, the persecutor, it's all your fault. I was critical, uh, I was controlling, and I was taking the superior position because I thought that was the way into leading the company into a better world. In 80% of the time, people will react as a victim. Oh, I'm sorry. You know, I'm you know, you are always late. You know, that's pretty much a, a persecuting position. Oh, I'm really sorry, bridge was open, you know, and the tires of my bicycle, and, and, and you know, and my, my, my radio clock's not working properly, uh, we had a power outage, you know, I don't know, it's poor me, purely powerless, hopeless, and stuck. In 80% of the time, your reaction will be, because you feel sorry for the person, you're like, okay, I'm gonna rescue that guy. Let me help you. You know, so you gotta start doing his or her work. So, if you start doing that, if you start rescuing, this is what I was doing, you know, start rescuing. First I was persecuting, I saw the victim part, I was rescuing to the max. Problem was, it messed up my personal agenda. So instead of working nine hours, I was working 12 hours a day. 
So at the end of the day, you know, I'm leaving the office, you know, everybody had gone already. The colleague, the, the victim colleague, had already left. You know, you know, his time was up, you know, and I was still there doing his job and my job. And you hear it already? I'm already persecuting the guy again. So then I drive home, my wife does, you're late, you know, I haven't seen you, you know, you know. Are you the entrepreneur who's always away instead of at home with the children and stuff? She's persecuting me and guess where I am? The victim. Yeah. So I started as a persecutor, you know, then I started being the rescuer, then I started persecuting again, I ended up being the victim. That was not really the place I wanted to be. So I asked my coach, okay, how can we get out of this? All right. So when you, um, in the drama triangle, um, you will often see that, or wait for somebody else to move, you know, to, to get out of the drama triangle, to get into action, um, and because he or she they basically must change. It's not you, it's the other person you know, that needs to change the way uh, they work. Um, and to realize that, you both need to know that you're all in the game together. And I got this brilliant little line from my coach. This is a lifesaver, you gotta write it down. Um, you see somebody who's not performing, you know, and first, you're gonna be factual. You know, um, I've been going over the times you've come in, and I see that about that 80% of the times you come in late. If I tell that person you're always late, I'm statistically wrong, and he will say that's not true, and we have an argument about the statistical fact that I was not right, not about the problem itself. So, you have to be statistically right, factually right. It says, okay, in 80% of the times I've been noticing going over your timesheets, you know, you're late. Um, and this is the brilliant line, remember this one. What can you do yourself to be on time? And then they, if they want to truly play that victim role, I don't know, well, go figure it out. You know, do some research, there's Google, uh-huh, Google has the answer to everything. But by answering that little question, I was empowering him to change. I went on with my day-to-day -day business and this left him and he's like, well, he's empowering me. You know, he felt strong and I was enabling him to change. So that was good. So this is basically the persecutor and the drama triangle and the different perspective, which I am going over right now. Um, when you start your communication, you know, you have to be talking from a standpoint, this is difficult, but there's a lot of emotion in you. And I told you, you have to push all that emotion out. Because if they see emotion, you're already in the drama triangle. So push your emotion out, be factual and state, I'm okay, you're okay. Because if you are the persecutor, you'll be, I'm okay, you're not okay. That's drama triangle. The rescuer says, okay, I'm not okay, you're okay, you know, and the victim, you know, that, that's, you know, you're not in an okay position, you know, you're in a plus minus situation. So, then I was, you know, so you've learned now about the drama triangle. I'm gonna show you a quadrant now. This is the second thing you'll be you know, learning today. So, here I am, I'm okay, you're okay. This is difficult. This is, you have to you know, be in, in full control over your body, your emotions, um, and if we, when you start a position from I'm okay, you're okay, you will have a healthy conversation. Um, if you uh, uh, starting the conversation uh, from I'm okay, you are not okay, you will be in the drama triangle, for sure. If you are in a position, I'm not okay, victim, you're okay, you're in the drama triangle. If you're, I'm not okay, and you're not okay, there's drama all over, you don't wanna be there, you know, I can tell you that. There could be another position, this is an ego position, I'm, I'm okay, no, no, I'm very much okay. You're okay, 
but I'm a little bit more okay than you are. Uh -huh. That's drama triangle as well. So um, then I found this other book, you know, um, and the book is called I'm Okay, You're an Idiot. <laughs> that was really fun to read, actually. So um, I was reading the book, and I think it was the first chapter, um, and it changed already my mind into I'm an idiot and you're okay. Yeah, um, because, you know, when you're I'm okay, you're not okay, you're an idiot, you know, you, you, you'll be entering the drama triangle. So one piece of advice, um, I, I, I'm, I'm skipping you know, a bit of my presentation now. Um, never ask, this, you gotta write this down as well, never ask a dot idiot question. If you ask somebody a question and you can put dot idiot behind it, you know, you're in an I'm okay, you're not okay position already. You know, that's an accusation you know, and trapped within a question. So, you're always, you're always late, dot idiot. You know, why are you always late, you idiot? You know, so, so you really gotta be factual and, you know, having the conversation from an I'm okay, you're okay position. So, okay, now bear with me. I'm gonna deep dive into transactional analysis. Um, Based on some observations, um, there was a there was a psychologist called Eric Byrne. I believe it was somewhere in uh, the, the 1950s or 60s, and the psychologists were talking about uh, um, uh, the, the psyche of people, um, and uh, it was all based on. And now I forgot the name of the the former psychologist. The um, ah. I've got the name of him, sorry. Um, well, anyway, in his uh, conversation with his clients, he found out that people were changing ego positions. So some, in sometimes they were having an adult position, they were talking from an adult position, and sometimes they were talking from a really childish-like position, you know, the, the free-minded, creative position, and sometimes they were like in a parent position. So he found out people, even within one conversation, could change in ego statuses. So it was Freud. Yes, I got the name now. Freud, in the past, was talking about ego statuses as well. And they were talking about the, the uh, ego statuses like the id. Uh, and nobody was understanding what Freud had written down. So Byrne came up with the modern form of psychology called transactional analysis. So, let me talk about the parent position, you know. The parent position reflects the absorption of over years of influences of actual parents. When you read the book, I'm okay, you're okay, you'll be learning that a child from the age of zero to about five is recording a lot of images from their parents. The way they act, the way they communicate, and they all store them in the parent position. In his life, the person will have leaders, um, like, for example, their manager, their CEO, their teacher, and all that kind of behavior from leaders around them, they will store in their parent position as being the truth. And they will act accordingly. And they are heavily recorded, and you cannot change that. You know, I still remember, you know, my parents saying, you know, wearing white socks, uh, that's not done, you know, you gotta wear colorful socks, you know, so. Uh, this is stored in my parent position. This is a really stupid example, but you know I won't ever wear white socks. You know, um, but as life changes, you know, and and over time, you start questioning all those scripts that you have within your system. That's what the adult position does. You know, um, this is where we hope to be as an adult, um, and <clears throat> it's dealing with all the vicissitudes of everyday everyday life. Um, and it's basically also uh, regulating uh, the activities between the parent and the child position. In short, behavior, thoughts, and feeling which are in direct response to the here and now. I'm okay wearing white socks, you know, although my parents just told me, like, white socks, that's a no-go area, you know, I'm okay with it now, but still, I know there's this script inside of me that says, uh, it's not okay to wear white socks. Okay, and then there's the child position. <coughs> child position is a really interesting one. Um, this is where we go basically back to our childhood. Um, it's childlike, it's not childish. 
And this is where the creative, the free-minded people are roaming. You know, they have no boundaries. You know, they they come up with crazy ideas and stuff, and they, those are not regulated by daily life or anything that's being stored in the uh, the parent position. If you read the book "I'm Okay, You're Okay," you'll be deep diving into these situations. Um, you have, for example, in the child position, there is the the free roaming child, the creative child, um, but you also have the, well, I'm calling, I don't know the right word of it right now, but it's called the obnoxious child. When the parent says to him, to, when I tell my kids to say, okay, clean up your room, you know, it's quite demanding, you know, it's a top-down position, that would be okay, and they don't clean their room properly, you know, you know that's going to happen, you know. So, but when I talk to my kids from, uh, and this is the parent position, you have the steering parent, you have to clean your room, and you have the feeding parent, a clean room cleans your head. So I would like to advise you to clean your room. You know, it's a mess, you know, but the clean room and, and your kid says, okay, you know, sounds good. So it's a different approach. So um, the lessons learned um, for me is by identifying whether you're stuck or stuck in the drama triangle, you can deviate from your position and you can always continue from an adult uh, dialogue position. Within meetings in my office, I now can easily identify in which position people are. When people are in the child position, they're free roaming, you know, they're blab brabbling away, you know, and well, some of the, the stuff they're saying, you know, I like, and some of the stuff I just don't like, you know. And then I have the 1% rule, you know, um, I'm focusing on the stuff they like, you know, and I address to them, it's like, hey, the stuff you just said, that little piece of information you gave me, I really like and to deep dive into it, and I ignore the rest, because they're just brabbling away. And then they're like, hey, wow, they're listening to me. Pe when people are in the child position, they want to be listened to. And once you listen, they move automatically to the adult position, and you can have an adult position, uh, an adult conversation again. So it's really interesting to identify in which position people are. Okay, so I'm gonna walk you through some key ideas. Um, great leaders identify other people's treats um, and act upon them. So yeah, um, I got the question earlier this morning, it's like, okay, why are you into psychology? So well, I want to be an effective leader, and effective leadership is about eff communicating effectively. So I have to identify the traits, I have to identify in which position people are to be able to communicate effectively. If I'm a steering parent, and the other person in his, in his, is in its child position, you know, will end up in a drama triangle, for sure. It won't, it, it won't work out, it won't be effective. So you have to get into the same position uh, to be effective. But that you know, requires some studying, reading the book, I'm okay, you're okay, and you'll be fine. So, okay, key, key position number two, uh, key idea number two, good leaders solve problems, and great leaders first ask questions to make sure the right problem is solved. Um, I got to look at the time. I got one, not two minutes left. Um, there's a parable that uh, that reflects this. Um, uh, there's a couple of blind men and an elephant. This this story originated in ancient India, um, and it's a story of a group of blind men who have never come across an elephant before, and who learn to conceptualize uh, what an elephant is by touching it. So the first uh, uh, one is just grabbing the till, and it says, "Yeah, that's her rope," you know, and. The other one is just grabbing the, the stomach and it says, no, it's a wall. And the other one just grabs the leg and says, no, it's a tree trunk. You know, so they all have a different perception of what an elephant is. So every now and then, you know, a couple of colleagues come into my office and they have a problem and they want to discuss it with me, you know, and based on what they are saying, you know, I can, you know, say something, you know, this is the way to go. But the first thing I'm do, uh, going to do is ask questions. Because each one of them has a different perception of what the problem is. And we have to find out, and, and I just say to them, okay, what's the elephant? And they're like, well, okay, yeah. So we gotta talk about the problems first. I'm gonna ask questions and questions and questions. And they come to realize what the total elephant is. And then we come up with a solution. Not, you know, based on the, the, the trunk or the, the, the till or whatever, or the stomach, no, the whole question. So all I'm doing now, saves me a lot of time, is just ask questions and they come up with a solution. I'm not bringing the solution to them, otherwise I'll be 
you know, uh, in a different position. Okay, great leaders set the standards and they act accordingly. That's really important. If you don't set the standards and you don't act accordingly, they won't follow you and they will um, uh, follow the standards. Um, people will view your actions and they will draw their own conclusions. You know, this is a, le a lesson I learned. Um, I, every month I give a presentation to the whole company about the state of the organization. Um, and everybody walks out with a different conclusion. You know, and they have their own opinion about it and their own conclusion. And then I have to rehearse, you know, and rehearse and just sometimes I got to rehearse myself about five times uh, to get the message across. You know, so we're all aligned. Um, people are, every, everybody's different and, and, you know, every brain is different. So everybody will consume the information in a different way. Um, this is an interesting one. This is what Einstein wrote. Everything is energy. And if you match the frequency of the reality you want, and you will get that reality. This is not a philosophy, this is physics. If I walk into a room with a lot of negative anger and I want something, you know, I will get a lot of negative anger back. It's not gonna happen. So if you tune in your energy in a way you wanna get something done, then you'll get it, you know? Um, you, you, this is, almost religion, you gotta believe in this. So everything is energy, your thoughts begin it, your emotions will amplify it, your actions give energy to the momentum, and people will feel it. Absolutely, this, and, and I believe this, this is, this is my religion. Same as the drama triangle, it's part of my religion as well now. You know. Okay, some tips and tricks. Um, I don't know if you've he ever heard about push and pull communication. Um, what happens, you know, when you're in an argument, you know, and the other party is just trying to blow you away with arguments, you know, he's pushing, you know, and you can push back, you know, and, but, you know, the energy goes up, it's like a volcano, you know, you're pushing and pushing and suddenly it erupts and you're in the drama triangle. What you can do is if you want to reach a certain outcome, you start pulling, it's basically asking questions. You know, and by asking questions, you can change his thoughts on the subject. You know, you can ask, okay, so I hear your argument about X, and uh, have you considered Y or Z, and how did you come up with that argument, and you know, and, and then they start revealing, you know, how they've come to a certain conclusion. You know, and along the way, you might be able to change their thoughts in a different direction. So that's a push and pull strategy. Well, I told you already about the dot idiot questions, you know, don't we dive into that. You know, the idiot questions are very ineffective. Uh, so it's all about, you know, effective communication. Um, and when you give feedback, you know, we're in America, I had to do this, the hamburger model, you know, um, you start with something positive. You know, your conversation is like, hey man, you're doing a great job, you know. But as of late, I see you're coming in, you know, quite a bit late, uh, and um, uh, let's see how you can improve that. But keep up the good work. That's squeezing in, you know, your argument, your, your um, uh, in between two nice pieces of buns. Um, and that is, this is a really effective way of communicating, and it's called the hamburger model. So you can deep dive into that as well. So I hope this will give you some insights. Um, it changed my life. You know, I'm far more effective. Um, once you had a record-breaking year uh, last year, um, the energy is excellent at the office right now. Um, I've been teaching this to all my colleagues, you know, so they all know about the drama triangle, and every now and then says, okay, man, it feels like you're in the drama triangle, you know? Maybe we should step out of it. You know, ah, oh, yeah, yeah, cool. You know, how can you improve your life? How can you improve your work? You know, and, and people are feeling really empowered and the, the company is just going superb again. 2017 is behind. I've, lesson, I've, I've learned my lessons and I'm very proud to have shared this with you. Thank you very much. Okay. And don't forget about the contribution uh, 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 possibilities and opportunities on Friday. There's mentored contribution, first time contribution workshop, and general contribution. Thank you. If you have any questions, you can come up to me and I'll uh, have a one on one with you.